Hello, everyone. Welcome to Kryptonize, where we, as altcoin maximalists, I think that's our new ta uh, tagline, isn't it, uh, uh, Amanda? Yes, it is. We're going to talk about an enterprise DeFi token today, and just enterprise DeFi in general. If you don't know what that is, I don't know what that is. So I'm hoping Rachel could shed some light on that for us. So Rachel, uh, would you please introduce yourself before we jump in? Sure. Uh, thanks again, Mark and Amanda, for having me on. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, my name is Rachel Wolfson. I'm a journalist um, currently with Cointelegraph, um, but I have written for publications like Forbes and Huffington Post in the past. I've been covering the blockchain, the blockchain and crypto space since 2017, so for quite a while now. In addition to that, I recently wrote an ebook on Bitcoin for beginners. It's a three-part guide that you can find on Amazon. And uh, I am an enterprise blockchain analyst with Quantum Economics. So those are kind of my official titles at the moment. Enterprise blockchain, that essentially means, you know, companies, bigger companies usually that are using the blockchain uh, in, a, in a B2B capacity. Is that correct? Is that a good layman's term for what enterprise blockchain is? Yeah, definitely. So I think enterprise, I mean, just to put it in basic terms, it's, I would say, blockchain being used for real world applications. So for instance, a really great example is using blockchain to track and trace where your food comes from. So that can be, you know, B2B or also B2C. So, you know, the, the consumer can understand where their coffee comes from, where their coffee beans come from. Um, small farmers can earn more by using blockchain technology to trace those beans all the way to the grocery store. So that's kind of an example of enterprise blockchain, just blockchain being used in the real world for real world use cases. Excellent. Um, now, you know, something that's been confusing to me is, OK, let's talk about enterprise DeFi to me, which is an oxymoron. But maybe you could shed some light on what enterprise DeFi is for us. Yeah, I can shed some light. Um, this is still a really new space. So even for me, it's very confusing. Um, so basically, we're seeing now this trend of tokenization. So enterprises are doing things like tokenizing invoices. That makes the whole process easier, more efficient, more transparent for companies with complex supply chains, for instance. And so now there's kind of a new concept that we're seeing emerging, which is basically called enterprise DeFi, which is taking DeFi concept, concepts like staking, for instance, and applying that into the enterprise world. Okay. So, you know, really, Rachel, when I think enterprise DeFi, I think decentralized finance but run by the enterprise? I mean, that, that to me is a little confusing. And then I know we're going to talk about um, UBT, Unibright. Uh, what, I mean, they're claiming this enterprise DeFi thing. What are they doing that's considered enterprise DeFi? Yeah. So, I mean, when it comes to Unibright's token, which is UBT, what I find really interesting is that Provide, their company, that's allowing you know enterprises to tokenize things such as invoices, for instance. They're allowing those companies to make payments with the UBT token. So that's a really interesting use case in terms of cryptocurrency being applied in the enterprise world today. Um, in terms of DeFi, I think that we're still really, really early. And like I said, even for me, that's a bit confusing. But I think eventually we want to see these DeFi concepts applied to the enterprise. How that will happen, not 100% sure yet, but I'm sure we'll see developments sooner or later where you know that becomes possible. What are some of the ways to mix public and private blockchain maybe to make that more efficient? Yeah, so public and private blockchains, it's kind of, that's, that's an interesting conversation. Um, right now, we're seeing a trend where more companies are kind of leaning towards public blockchains. Um, we're seeing that possible just because the space has matured to the point where enterprises are starting to feel comfortable using public networks. Um, a large part of that is because, for instance, uh, the baseline protocol, they're really making this happen. Uh, they've developed, you know, these privacy protocols that allow for companies to use a public network for things like, you know, sending invoices and doing all of all of that on a public network. However, that being said, private networks are still very much alive and thriving. IBM blockchain is a great example of that. There are still so many companies out there using IBM blockchain's technology and private networks um, you know, for things like tracing and tracking food and for supply chain management. So we're seeing a combination of two, if that answers your question, Amanda. Yeah, it does. So if you look at, Rachel, if you look at decentralized finance, to me, I don't understand how an enterprise can control it. But let's go beyond that and see if we can't find any value in it. So my understanding of Unibright is that they provide an architecture of architectures, meaning you can join their architecture and they're facilitating payments between blockchains as one example. 
uh, and they're just doing a lot of facilitating between blockchains and, and other companies. But I, I don't know much more than that. Is, is there anything more that you know that they're doing that's interesting that people should be paying attention to? Yeah. So I think one really important thing here that we need to remember is that enterprises don't want to, or they usually don't want to use cryptocurrency when it comes to payments. I mean, using blockchain is confusing enough. They basically want things easy, not confusing. And so what Provide is doing, they're saying their clients can pay with UBT and that gets put into you know, a custody wallet and they don't have to deal with the cryptocurrency side of things moving forward. Those payments are facilitated in UBT, but they don't have to actually facilitate that, if that makes sense. So they can use the UBT token without having to be confused or you know, having to understand what cryptocurrency is. It's all very easy. And so I think that's something that we need to remember here is that if we do have a token for enterprise use, we need to make it, to the, we need to make it accessible to the enterprises without them having to fully understand what is cryptocurrency, what is happening, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, it does. But a uh, few things I'm confused about is, so how do you buy the UBT? You use a credit card, you transfer money into a wallet, and then it converts to UBT. How, how does that work? So you can buy UBT on certain exchanges. Um, I'm not sure which ones, but you can buy it. And if enterprises want to use UBT for provide payments, for instance, the company provide for their services, they can take the UBT token and actually do that. That money gets put into a custodied wallet, from what I understand, and then provide kind of facilitates the rest. I also think fiat payments can be made as well, but it's just interesting to point out that the UBT token is being utilized um, for enterprise use right now. I don't know many tokens that actually do that. I don't know any others that are actually doing the same thing, which makes UBT really unique in the sense that it is kind of an enterprise blockchain token. And didn't they recently partner with Kona, which Kona provides the IT services for Coca-Cola? And what I'm learning about yeah, beyond, yeah. beyond just the token, it seems to me that the partnerships of which these tokens have really help to, you know, or at least define how, how great the security will be or, by, you know, whatever it is. It just seems that, that the partnerships they have are, are critical. Right. Amanda, you bring up a really great point. So I, and I covered that story. Uh, Coke One North America, they are baselining their supply chain. So basically they're trying to tokenize their supply chain, tokenize invoices, for instance, just to make the whole process much easier. I mean, you have to think about it. Kona, Coke One North America has a very complex supply chain. Think about all the parties involved. If they use blockchain, that brings so much more transparency and organization and trust to the whole um, to the whole value chain. So that that's a really good point that you bring up. Coca-Cola must think so, but is it better than what's being done now? I've done a lot of work in the supply chain space, and it was always painful to kind of you know, watch how the ingredients were formed into a product and the product shipped overseas and then, you know, to the retailers. Is that, is what's being introduced on the blockchain, which arguably is kind of a slow technology, maybe, you know, uh, Unibrite's made it faster. Is that arguably why it's better is because everything's tracked because everything is assigned to one, one block and, and you could follow it and, and query at any point in time. Yeah. I mean, Mark, those are definitely benefits. Like we have to think about what the blockchain provides. So when you think about that and put it in terms of enterprise and supply chain, all of those benefits get um, put, put on there as well. So transparency, trust. If you have a supply chain with multiple parties trying to communicate with each other and sending each other invoices, I mean, obviously you get lost in translation. With a blockchain, those invoices get tracked and traced. You know who's sending that to who. On a public blockchain, these things are transparent. Trust is built between parties. So when we think about enterprise blockchain, especially on a public network, um, these benefits can all be realized. If an invoice was tokenized and it wasn't a paper invoice anymore, I mean, that creates so many benefits versus just using these paper invoices. So that's kind of what we're seeing now um, with these new use cases of enterprise blockchain. And they're also handling the payments as well? So I think, you know, when it comes to Unibrite and Provide, like I said, UBT payments can be used to pay for Provide services. And I'm pretty sure if Provide will handle those payments where the enterprise doesn't have to be confused about anything. I do think fiat payments as well can also be used for Provide services. The bigger question I have is if Unibrite is handling all of this, I suspect that there's all sorts of 
cool reporting that you can do and mapping that you could do and dashboards that you can create. And you don't have to go through multiple providers with APIs and all the rest of this stuff. But getting people on the blockchain that are part of this ecosystem would seem like the, the big challenge. Um, is that your read on it? Yeah, I agree. So I, I also want to point out, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier in the podcast, Provide and Unibright are now one. They're, they're one company. So I think that's important to mention. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know that, but that is the case. So Unibright payments happening on the Provide platform, that goes hand in hand. That just is kind of a natural fit once they merge together. So the question is, it seems to me the big challenge that Unibright is going to have, if they don't already, is getting everyone to use the system that's in the ecosystem. So like you said, with Coca-Cola, for example, there, there might be 100 different suppliers that are part of that. Now, getting them all to use the Unibright system seems like it'd be a tall order. Yeah. So, I mean, I think getting all suppliers within a supply chain to use a blockchain network is the challenge here. Um, I think that there are still companies that are very hesitant when they hear blockchain they don't want to be on board. They may wonder why, why is blockchain even needed? Um, but I think right now, especially with Kona, and Kona is using the baseline protocol, just not to, to confuse it with Unibright or Provide. Kona is using baseline to kind of tokenize their supply chain. They're using it for supply chain management. And that example right there is going to make a huge impact because they're such a large company. So for them to be doing this with blockchain, with the baseline protocol, is a really big deal. Um, and then I think more companies will start to recognize that. And once they understand the value there, more companies will probably jump on board. But I think it's important here to note that the space has matured to the point where companies can now use public networks for blockchain. And that's because privacy protocols have been, have been advancing. They're all baked into to these, you know, to the baseline protocol, for instance, they're there to the point where information can be shared on a public network without having you know, those intense secrets exposed. The companies that need to know certain information will know that information without having their private data or their private information exposed, if that makes sense. Yep. Um, okay, so I think we were pretty short and succinct. I think you did a great job of uh, outlining what enterprise DeFi is. I still think it's kind of a oxymoron just a little bit. I mean, the enterprise is controlling it, so I don't know how it's decentralized, but anyway, uh, is there anything else that we should know about the enterprise or DeFi space that uh, that you're keeping an eye on in uh, your journalist uh, capacity? Yeah, definitely. So, well, enterprise DeFi is still really new. So it just, it's still a confusing concept, even for me. I just want to put that out there. In terms of the enterprise blockchain space, so I've been covering the space since 2017. Initially, it was all about private networks. Now we're seeing a trend and a move towards public networks. And like I said, Mark, that move is just becoming possible because the space has matured with privacy protocols like zero knowledge proofs. Those are baked into things like the baseline protocol. And Ernst & Young, for instance, they're doing great work as well to um, facilitate public blockchains for enterprise use. And so that's the trend that we're seeing now. And we're only seeing that trend just because the space has matured to that point where privacy protocols can be baked into these public networks to allow enterprises to actually use them. Because before, it was only about private networks. You don't want anyone else knowing that information, and it has to be on a private network. But now that information can be on a public network. And because of things like zero knowledge proofs, that information doesn't have to get exposed to everyone on that network, if that makes sense. So these privacy protocols have matured to the point where now companies are saying, oh, it's probably more efficient, more transparent, and more cost effective to use public networks versus private networks. That's not to say private networks are, are dead and gone. That's far from the truth. IBM blockchain is doing great work. The companies are, many companies are still using their technology, which, you know, private networks for supply chain management. I just think it's a new trend that we're seeing now for public networks to be utilized in the enterprise. Yeah, I think I was very, very thorough, although high level. Um, I'd like to see um, some movement in the space. My roots are in B2B enterprise level stuff. I'd like to see companies like IBM adopting the blockchain. I just haven't seen any killer use cases yet. This might be one if it uh, if you can get everybody on board to use it because just because of the transparency. And I, I know this blockchain doesn't share sensitive information with people that are accessing it, just the information that they need to, to keep moving along the, the, the supply chain. So that's pretty cool. Okay. So Rachel, how do people get a hold of you if they have any questions or comments uh, for you in regards to enterprise DeFi or just enterprise blockchain? Yeah. 
So I'm very active on crypto Twitter. My handle is at RachelWolf00. Um, so that's probably the best way to reach out to me. I use Instagram occasionally, so people can reach out to me there. My handle is blockchain and bikinis, kind of a funny handle, but it just, it's my personality. I write about blockchain and I go to the beach a lot. Um, so Instagram is another way to reach out, but I'd say Twitter is probably the best, the best way to reach out. Um, yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you for being on the show. If you like this episode or any of the episodes, please like subscribe and comment. We answer every one of them. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks again, Rachel. Thanks, Mark and Amanda.